very happy to see you all here uh, for the the third of the series uh, that Paul Nurse will be will be presenting. Um, so Paul just informed me that he he really enjoys crises and um, he can't actually function if there isn't a crisis. Um, so you know, having just got through COVID myself, and he has too. Hopefully, we'll get through today without too much of a crisis. But I should say um, just a few words of introduction. Um, so these two talks by Paul will be scientific um, about his own research and um, how he made some of the discoveries about the cell cycle and the beautiful choreography that I think everyone has to marvel at, how he <coughs> cracked its logic. So today this is, this is going to be the first of the two talks where he, he, he actually, I think, describes the path that led to the discoveries. And I, I feel very privileged because I was a PhD student in the um, late 80s at the ICRF when Paul was actually in the midst of making the discovery of what the we mutants were about and actually finding out that these cyclin-dependent kinases were also um, conserved in humans. So it was a really exciting time. I'm not quite sure how to... I don't think one ever relives these moments where you just know that something big is happening. Um, and it was. And so hopefully... Uh, some of that excitement without crisis will be shared with us today. So thank you, Paul, so much for coming again and looking forward to hearing you. Well, thank you, Edith. Thank you for coming on this beautiful day. You know, Paris is wonderful at the moment. Um, and my wife, Anne's here, sitting at the back, and we've um, wandered around. It's a wonderful city you live in. It's great to be here. So my two previous talks were popular talks. Um, on um, you know, basically what is science and what is life. This is, as Edith said, is about my own research, which is on the cell cycle. Um, this talk is about logic. That's the title. Um, and by that, I really mean just thinking about the, the conceptual basis of, uh, of um, what we mean by control and how we can... Um, find out how it might work. And it, is the, uh, it has a focus on the earlier part of my career because at that time, we had no tools except our eyes and looking down the microscope, classical genetics and thinking. That's all we had. And it was really in the tradition of those great um, uh, French... Um, uh, geneticist um, Jacob and Mono and the way that they approach the lac operon and honestly it is it is of course very different but um, it was only 10 years before um, what I was doing and I was completely immersed in what they had done and their thinking and so you will see echoes of that uh, type of thinking as we go through. So um, where did it all start? It did actually start as a graduate student because I, I was working on a really boring topic. And when I mean, you know, you know uh, graduate students always moan about their projects. Well, in my case, um, I had good reason to moan about my project. It wasn't that I, I wasn't being looked after well and I had good supervision. I was taught how to do experiments, controls, how to interpret them, very high standards. All of that was good. I had a good supervisor. It's just... A boring topic. It was amino acid metabolism in an obscure fungus. Okay, and I liked doing the experiments. I liked thinking about it. But I thought, but as we all know, experiments fail all the time. And I thought, if I'm going to suffer this much, it's got to be at least aimed at doing something important and interesting. So whilst I was attempting to get this amino, automatic amino acid analyzer to work, which was a, a prototype machine, which means it never worked, um, and sat around uh, filling it up with rubber bungs, elastic, and so on, to um, uh, take out all the safety devices so it might actually work for a, a particular run. Um, whilst I was doing all of that, I began to think, what do I want to do 
um, after this. And I thought, I should try and work on an important problem. What is an important problem? Now, what we normally do is then read the sort of, um, you know, topical comics like Nature and Cell and all those things and see what everybody else is doing. And I thought, I don't want to do that because it's already been done. And you just, you know, and it just isn't the right way to go. So I went back and thought, what is it um, that is fundamental to life? And, I mean, I honestly did this, and I came up with various things, and one of them was the fact that, um, that um, all living things reproduce. They reproduce. And so I thought, yeah, that's important, so reproduction's a, a big thing. Um, but uh, what's the sort of most basic um, example of that? And, of course, the cell being the basic unit of all life, it is the reproduction of a cell from one to two. So I thought, this makes sense. It's an important problem. I'd like to understand it. Wasn't very much going on in it, and almost nothing on control. And so I um, decided this was what I wanted to do. I was 23 at the time, and I'm still doing it 50 years later. So I actually think that it um, wasn't a bad choice. And I recommend, if we have graduate students in the audience, don't look at nature, science, and cell. Have a think about what really interests you and something that's in, in, important. Because if you just look at the, uh, at the um, fancy journals, it'll all be done in two or three years, and it's not useful. What you see up there is a dividing mammalian cell undergoing reproduction. Simplest example of reproduction, as I said. Also, um, it is in... Um, quite a fundamental sense, the simplest developmental sequence that living things do. Because what you see in the cell cycle, which is, of course, the um, a process by which a cell um, reproduces itself, is um, a reproduction of the cell in space, so to bring about a, a duplication of spatial order, and the a temporal sequence of events that leads to that. So it is both got spatial and temporal order in there, which is, must have been the very first um, such developmental process for life, which, of course, was one single cell. So that was another reason, really, by that I, I thought this would be a, a, an interesting thing um, to look at. So the cell cycle, we've all seen this. It, uh, uh, if you look at it, the main uh, components, and there's many things that go on, but the main components there are to bring about successful um, uh, replication of the hereditary material and segregation, proper segregation of that replicated material into the two newly divided cells. Through a process of S phase by which chromosomes replicate and M phase, mitosis in the mitotic cell cycle, whereby those duplicated chromosomes um, segregate into the two newly divided cells with the very imaginatively named processes G1, which stands for gap one, and G2 for gap two, um, that we all end up with G1S, G2, and M. So this is the developmental um, sequence. Now, I could state the problem clearly in my head, but I wanted to know how it worked, how was it controlled, and how on earth do you go about that when you know nothing about the process? And really, we didn't know anything about the process, and I'm talking um, early uh, to mid-70s at this time. And, um, of course, I did do some reading. I was very impressed by what has been done in bacteria in the 60s. Um, uh, Francois Jacob, again, particularly and also Sidney Brenner, who just took some genetics. They just looked for mutants and speculated on what it all meant. And then that was picked up by Lee Hartwell, working with budding yeast uh, uh, about 10 years later, um, a year or so before I was thinking about these things, um, who identified mutants that um, uh, were defective in the cell cycle, the ability to reproduce, and um, defined so-called CDC genes for cell division cycle. So I thought, this is the approach. Get mutants, look at them, try and understand what's going on. And that's what you're going to hear about for uh, certainly half of the talk. Then the other half, um, we get into molecular genetics and a little bit more of molecular mechanism, but still very much based on the logic of it. 
Now, um, Lee Hartwell's working with budding yeast. Budding yeast is a beautiful system. It's um, fantastic genetics, fantastic people who work on it. But it doesn't have quite a normal cell cycle. That's because it's called budding yeast, because it divides by budding. And most cells do not divide by budding. They divide by midi medial fission of some sort. Um, and um, the organism that does that, which is genetically most amenable, is the fission yeast Schizosaccharomyces pombi here. Um, and so this was being worked on in, um, in Edinburgh by Murdoch Mitchison. I'll show you a picture of him in a moment. Um, and he'd been working on it um, uh, with a, quite a small group for uh, 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 about five uh, years before this. But he was not a geneticist. He knew no genetics. So I went to see him and said, I'd like to do this as a postdoc. And he said, great idea. I don't have any money. Raise some money for yourself and you can come. Um, learn some genetics and you can come. Okay. So I went to um, learn genetics in Bern with Urs Leopold. Here are my two um, advisors of the time. Urs Leopold, who's Swiss, obviously, with that alpine horn. This was taken at his retirement party. And Murdoch Mitchison doing the washing up. And the person behind there is my wife, actually, who can wave now. She's sat at the back there. She's not going to. She's shaking her head, doing the washing up. And what is normally said is, where is Paul? Um, there's washing up and therefore no Paul to be seen. So I went to Murdoch. He was professor, head of department. I went there for a few months, six months, to learn genetics. He decided to spend two hours with me twice a week teaching me genetics, just to help me. And he did it for six months. It was very complicated genetics, so I did learn quite... It was all to do with suppression and allosuppression and, and, and so on, nonsense suppression, which was topical at the time. And then I could take those skills, and I did to Murdoch Mitchison, um, who understood the cell physiology. And what I want to say just about these two gentlemen is that I published about 15 papers whilst I was in both of their labs, and they didn't put their name on any paper I produced, not because they didn't like it, but because they didn't do something with their own hands to contribute to it. And, of course, this was of enormous help to me at the time. So this is Murdoch and this is Urs. What did I do? I first of all copied um, Lee Hartwell. I isolated cell division cycle mutants, which um, cannot um, complete the cell cycle. In fission yeast, if you look to the right, um, on A, you'll see what a wild-type cell looks like. It's dividing. And then you see the variety of mutants. This was published in 1976. Um, and you'll see that these um, mutants... Um, can't divide, but they can grow. So they just get bigger. And th that actually um, was quite important because obviously any defect in growth will stop cell division. And I mean, and that's of no relevance to understanding how cells reproduce themselves. You just have to assume that the growth processes um, can, ca can carry on and therefore you get highly elongated cells. I forget quite how many mutants we got through temperature-sensitive screens. I was helped by Kim Naismith, who was a graduate student there, and I looked after him for three or four years, and by Pierre Turio, who you'll see a picture of a bit later, who actually worked in, in Paris but was working in Switzerland um, at the time. We identified about 30 CDC genes over a, a, a couple of years, um, which defined functions that were required for successful reproduction of the cells. We actually know now, and I think I'll probably say something about this next week, because we've deleted every gene in fission yeast, and we've screened for all cell cycle genes, and we know there are around 300 uh, CDC-like genes which are essential for um, cell reproduction. So at this stage, in the mid-'70s, we had about 10% only of the total genes that we had to be thinking about. We didn't know what percentage we had, um, but um, that, that was the... Um, um, that was the case. However, what this did was to identify only genes that were necessary for the cell cycle, not necessarily genes that controlled progression through the cell cycle. And I wrestled with this and couldn't work out a way forward um, until um, this bit of logic here. What we see here 
These are slides I drew by hand at the time. I thought you'd be entertained to see what it used to look like. You'll see a number of these things. Um, and we've got time through the cell cycle. We've got cell mass. We've got the line of cells increase. You'll see a normal cell cycle. A cell increases. Oh, fission yeast is a rod. It just grows in length, so it's very convenient for measuring how big it is. It increases in mass, completes the cell cycle, goes back to the beginning. Block it, and you end up with a CDC cell cycle block. Now, if, on the other hand, you have a mutant, which is rate-limiting for progression through the cell cycle, rate-limiting in the sense that it determines the overall time by which it takes for a cell to reproduce itself, and therefore is uh, potentially controlling, then if you find a mutant which actually advances you through the cell cycle prematurely, that uh, potentially identifies a component well, first of all, it tells you there are such things as rate-limiting steps, because they don't have to be. It could all be lots of little steps. And secondly, it identifies a gene that has some uh, function in it. That is incredibly simple. Now, I'd like to say that I went through the logic, thought of it, and looked for wee mutants. Sorry, not true. What I was doing was screening under the microscope, looking for big ones, and then spotted some little ones. And it was looking at the little ones. I sometimes call it paying attention to what nature gives you. It was looking at those small mutant cells. It took about 15 seconds for me to recapitulate what you see here. Now, I then went running around like a headless chicken showing it to everybody. And people said, oh, it's a contamination. It's a budding yeast. It's staphylococcus or, or something. And I said, no, no, it really is fission yeast. And it's really advanced through the cycle. And it's really important. And it was. I have to say, it was. So how did we show it was important? Well, the very first mutant, which I called we one, by the way. It, I, I was working in Edinburgh. We is the Scottish word for small. I thought it was very funny at the time. 50 years later, it sort of wears a bit thin, but I did think it was amusing at the time. And what you see is on the left is what it looked like at low temperature. At the right is what it looked like, and is clearly we, at high temperature. Peter Fantes was a colleague, and I spoke a lot with him at the time. And this is him there. And the critical graph, which was published in 1975, you can see here, was all I did was took these cells and shifted them to the high temperature and asked the question, when did they start dividing at a small size? Because that would define where in the cell cycle this function worked. Because if it took a cell cycle before they started to divide at a small size, it meant it operated early in the cycle. If it happened quickly, it would be late. Well, the, uh, and this slide on the left uh, is that analysis. And, and the answer was it acted at the end of G2 at the onset of mitosis. So what we had here was a gene called We1. It showed that there was a rate-limiting step for cell cycle progression. It acted in G2 over um, the timing of mitosis. So this, was, this simple experiment revealed um, some of the logic, but also that there was something worth actually um, 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 studying, um, studying here, which, of course, was also um, important. So then I thought, I have to get more wee mutants. First one, accidental. So I gave myself the task of isolating 50. I thought I could then identify all the genes. Right? It took about a day or two for each mutant, and it was immensely tedious. And it, it, I forget how long, probably half a year, um, to get my 50 uh, um, wee mutants. As I went along, I crossed them to see if they, um, how, what genes they were in. And I got to um, number 47, and they had all been in we one OK? All in we one I'll take, pick that up in a moment, but this wasn't very satisfactory. Then I had a whole zoo of mutants in the same um, gene. Now, thinking of Jacob and Mono and thinking of, you know, what do we want to know? Is this, uh, we want to see uh, the, uh, do the genetic analysis to find out what it's doing. And the first thing is, is it acting positively or is it acting negatively? So we would look for dominance or recessive behavior. But when we looked at that, or when I looked at it, it was um, semi-dominant, okay? Semi-dominant. Uh, 
which, of course, sits in the middle, a gene dosage. It may, you know, dominance is not so easy to interpret. So then I had the bright idea, having um, worked with um, Erz Leupold, who worked, as I said, on nonsense suppressors, I thought maybe one of these mutations is a nonsense mutant. Now, I naively thought that if you have a truncated protein, which is what would be generated with a nonsense mutation, that that was unlikely to have function. Therefore, um, it would, if I could show that one of these um, 47 mutants that I had was nonsense suppressible, that would suggest the phenotype came about due to a truncated protein, and therefore, um, it was acting as an inhibitor. It was negative. Do you get it? I mean, you can see why I'm saying this is sort of typical Jacob Mono sort of um, um, type of thinking. Well, one of those 47, actually allele 112 here, turned out to be nonsense suppressible by one of the nonsense suppressors. We had, I had a, a, a battery of them, about 10 different ones I looked at, did all the crosses, one worked. And that led me to believe that um, the, the uh, uh, and this is Pierre Turio here on the right, actually, who worked in, um, uh, in Paris, I told you, for many years. Um, that's me on the left when I had hair color and it was a bit longer than it is now, okay? And I was pontificating as usual, as you can see. And um, so I concluded that we one had to be a, a negative um, element. Now, I'd stopped at mutant 47, you remember? Mutant 48, which I initially isolated on a cold November day in Edinburgh, it was covered with a fungus on the plate. I threw it away in the rubbish, felt guilty about it later, cycled back in the pouring rain, rescued it from the rubbish bin, um, spent a week micro-manipulating it away from fungus, and hey, it wasn't we one. The only one that wasn't we one. So I called it we two. At this point, I realized names can be a bit silly sounding. Okay, it's we too. This time, it was perfectly dominant. So this looked like a gain of function mutation and suggested maybe we had a gain of function mutation um, in this control, um, which um, was suggest we got two elements, a negative one and a positive one. Then I thought, well, if a gain of function is we, the loss of function would be CDC. And you'll recall I had 30 CDC mutations. So if we were lucky, if I crossed this mutant allele with the CDC mutants, I might find a gene which was a loss of function. Did that, and I was lucky. It, um, uh, it, 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 it mapped to CDC2, which is a gene that I'd isolated that was required at G2 for the onset of mitosis. But I'm a bit of an anal sort of person, and I was worried because I did classical crosses, and it was less than a centimorgan linkage. But what if we 2 was just adjacent to CDC2? They weren't the same gene. So then I, um, I took all the CDC2 alleles, which I had, and by that time I had about 10, and I made a fine structure map. Uh, Seymour Benzer, phage, you remember that sort of stuff. This is the same type just before this. I did a fine structure map, you can see it there, and I mapped the wee one allele there, and it was plumb in the middle. After I'd finished this, which took six months, by the way, I looked carefully at the CDC mutants and found that one of them, CDC 256, was we at the permissive temperature and CDC at the high temperature, which would have meant I didn't have to do any of those experiments because a single allele was CDC and we. Um, but I only noticed it after I'd done all the crosses. However, that led to um, me concluding um, that it really was um, a, a positive element, CDC2, and a negative element, we one acting over a rate-limiting step over the onset of mitosis. I was excited by this, I'll be quite honest, but the world wasn't, really. It was classical genetics. Um, you know, people were... Uh, it was no biochemistry. It was all abstract functions. Um, and people were much more interested in the G1 to S transition at the beginning of the cell cycle. Um, Lee Hartwell had defined it in budding yeast, something called START. Um, people like Art Pardee had talked about the restriction point in G1. 
um, where um, Edith was at ICRF. Everybody was talking about controls in G1. Really, there wasn't much interest in this. Now, I wanted to get a job because I didn't have one. I was still on short-term contracts. And I thought, well, I could repeat Lee's experiments to look for a start, and maybe more people might be interested in what I was doing. And um, what, in fact, Lee did... Um, was use CDC mutants, you look at the top right here, CDC mutants to block at different stages of the cycle, and then ask the question, it's a developmental biology question, is this mutant committed to the cell cycle? And the way um, he asked that question was to challenge cells blocked at that point and to see if they could undergo an alternative developmental pathway. If they could, then his reasoning was it wasn't committed yet to the mitotic cell cycle. Typical developmental biology type of, um, of argument. And um, he had identified um, several genes, including one called CDC28, which I will uh, refer to a bit later, that acted in G1, um, and called this the start for the start of the cell cycle. So I did these experiments, and I went round and um, tested for sporulation. And uh, if you're following what I'm saying, basically, if everything can sporulate, you get 100%. Um, anything over 80% was 100% as far as I was concerned. If it couldn't do it, um, it shouldn't sporulate. Anything under 5% was 0% as far as I was concerned. Everything worked beautifully for the 30 CDC mutants, except CDC2. CDC2, which um, was blocking... Um, a, a, a G2 uh, to mitosis, but it showed 15 to 20% sporulation, as if it was partially... Um, it, 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 it was to some extent committed and to some extent not committed. You know, and 15% suggest which weren't committed. And I really couldn't understand it. I was tempted... I really was tempted to forget about CDC2 and publish everything else, okay, where it was all clear. And then I kept waking up at night in a cold sweat and thinking, I, I can't do something like this. And then I, I thought about it, because you know, I, I kept doing the experiment again and again and again, and I thought, there's something wrong with the temperature. So I got a bigger thermometer to measure the temperature properly. I adjusted the temperatures. I did all this stuff. It always came out the same. And after about a couple of months of this, I thought, perhaps I should just try and think about this and believe it's true what I'm seeing. It is 20%. Believe it or not, I hadn't actually thought that before. I just thought I'd screwed up, okay? So I thought, well, if it's true. And then I thought, well, maybe this mutant actually acts twice in the cell cycle. It's needed at mitosis, G2 to mitosis, but it's also required at G1 to S phase. And that because the G1 is very short in the conditions I was growing these cells, that there were a fraction of cells that were arrested pre-start, and those were the 15%, 20% that um, would, would um, uh, sporulate and therefore uh, were not committed to the cycle. And that was true. So when I synchronised the cells, synchronised them so they're all in G1, I got 100% sporulation. So now I was very excited because what this meant was that CDC2 was required at the two major control points in the cell cycle. It was acting in the rate-limiting step for G2 to mitosis, where we one was uh, interacting in a negative way to CDC2. Another gene called CDC25, we'd since identified, also interacted in a positive way. And that CDC2 also acted at the G1 to S phase um, um, uh, a transition. Now, then I thought, we're on the money, I have to say. The logic was right, you know, we had... Uh, 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 how you define control, um, and there were two, two ways of defining it here. One was what's rate limiting, and the other is have you started the process, are you committed to it or not, and CDC2 ticked both boxes. So it had to be important. But the problem with all of this is, uh, of course, it's in, this is all genetics and observation, as I said. It's actually the good thing about it, because you had to think all the time about this stuff to get it um, clear in your head. But, of course, what we wanted was mechanism, molecular mechanism. So this is around 1980, and um, I quickly realised that um, 
if we were going to make any progress, we had to be able to transform fission yeast with exogenous DNA. Gene cloning was just beginning to come um, about and um, work out transformation systems and how to delete genes and so on. And otherwise, I couldn't take the cell cycle apart. So I was then working in the University of Sussex. I'd moved from Edinburgh. Um, I had a postdoc called David Beach, who had uh, um, worked in um, a, a, um, a, a cloning lab, very early uh, stages cloning lab, and we worked together on it and developed um, transformation procedures, made libraries, how to delete genes, all these things. It took a year or two to do it. And then I could apply it to cloning um, the genes I was interested in. And the first thing that did come out, and these are papers that I uh, um, did with David, one to get transformation to, uh, to, to work, cloned the CDC2 gene. Um, I had a few hiccups on the way and cloned a suppressor, first of all, um, but that's another story. We managed to sort that out before making fools of ourselves. And um, had a, then a gene seek. We had a gene in our hands, a couple of KB. Now, at the time, it took about a year to sequence a KB of DNA, um, believe it or not. And I, um, I was, uh, went to see Sanger, and he put me in contact with one of his colleagues, and they were worked their way through this gene, and it took about a year. So whilst they were um, sequencing it, um, I thought, what can we do next? Now, I've already said um, that um, most people weren't interested in um, fission yeast um, because it wasn't a, a mammal, but there were quite a big field interested in budding yeast. And I thought, is there a, is there a possibility that um, there's a gene equivalent to CDC2 in... Um, in in, um, in, in budding yeast. And um, only four CDC genes had been cloned in budding yeast. One of them was CDC28. Um, and um, uh, what we went on to show was that if we took CDC28, um, which had been cloned um, by um, Steve Reed, working in the west coast of the US, and we put it in fission yeast, it could rescue CDC2. So that meant that these two genes, and I use the word functionally homologous, which got me into deep trouble with the evolutionary biologists. Um, but, um, uh, not, you can't have them. They don't like that sort of statement. Um, but basically, this meant that uh, not only was CDC2 important for fission yeast, but it was also the controlling function in CDC20, uh, through CDC28 in budding yeast as, um, as, as well. Having cloned the gene, then we could move, and, and this is, uh, 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 we could then move to actually seeing what it did. And uh, once I got the sequence out, um, there were only, there were less than 100, less than 100 genes have been sequenced. And 50% of them were cytochrome C, okay, um, because that's what, that was been done by amino acid um, sequencing initially. And um, it only had homology to one gene in uh, PP Sark 60, the um, virus, and there was speculation the gene that was encoded was a protein kinase. So I thought we should try and see whether our gene was uh, encoded a protein kinase. And that um, was uh, what I did. What we did there, and this was now getting beyond my pay grade, to be quite honest. I mean, um, we expressed it in bacteria, purified the protein, put it into a rabbit, got an antibody. This seemed like alchemy to me, by the way. Um, and um, then uh, immune precipitated something from fission yeast and did some protein kinase assays, just throwing the sigma catalog at it until I got P32 in a protein, which happened to be casein, a milk protein, obviously functionally very relevant to the cell cycle. And um, the, uh, we got a, a, a signal. And I thought, this is, how can we believe this stuff? You know, how can you believe it? I mean, it could be all contaminants, you know? And then... Um, had the idea, well, what we could do is we could do this experiment with an extract from a TS CDC2 mutant and then see whether any of the TS strain extracts were temperature sensitive in vitro. And this is this experiment here. Wild type, the kinase activity wasn't temperature sensitive in vitro. Uh, 256, you've heard about it again, was temperature sensitive in vitro. That, so that showed us 
It was only when you made an extract from a temperature-sensitive CDC2 strain that it was temperature-sensitive in vitro, and we looked at several different um, alleles. This was work done by Viesta Simanis, who's not seen here, and Sergio Moreno. And Sergio, also, we looked at synchronous cultures. If you look top right there, you'll see the black dots go up to a peak. The, the, the white circles is actually cells in mitosis. And it looked as if the CDC2 protein kinase was going to a peak just before the onset of mitosis. So that led us to think that um, the key control was engineered by a protein kinase, CDC2, um, and that it was activated at the end of G2 to bring about onset of um, mitosis. Well, Paul Russell came to the lab. Um, he cloned WE1 and CDC25 using a combination of molecular genetics and logical thinking. Um, uh, concluded WE1 was an inhibitor, of course, CDC25 was positive, and they acted upstream to CDC2. Turned out it didn't have to be like that. They act directly upstream, and that was shown actually by Cathy Gould, who showed in this, uh, this paper here that actually WE1, which was a protein kinase also, phosphorylate CDC2 on tyrosine 15, which is uh, close to the ATP binding site um, of the protein kinase. So that, um, that when it's tyrosine phosphorylated, the kinase activity is reduced and the cells can't go into mitosis. Um, if you um, uh, now um, uh, get rid of WE1, you go into mitosis prematurely because it's not tyrosine phosphorylated. And CDC25 runs counter to that. Um, and we speculated, of course, it was a phosphatase. Um, I looked and looked at what phosphatase sequences there were there. I never found, you know, the, the databases, the algorithms never found anything. And then I found myself stuck on a 747 across the Atlantic, and the only things I had in my bag was the sequence of the phosphatase and CDC25. And I looked at it for about five hours, and I found three amino acids that were okay. Um, and I thought, I can't believe this. Do you know they turned out to be in the active site of the phosphatase? I just couldn't bear to say it, but it was true. Okay, so that she showed that it's tyrosine phosphorylated, regulated by WE1 and CDC25. This control, tyrosine phosphorylation of CDC2 at G2M, turns out to be um, key for the um, uh, checkpoint control um, at G2 to mitosis. That was also invented by Lee Hartwell. And this was shown um, for Tamar Enoch. What we showed is that if you block DNA replication, you block mitosis. But if you can't tyrosine phosphorylate CDC2, you go into mitosis. So in actual fact, that regulation worked. And, and she showed that with hydroxyurea and then with DNA damage. So the checkpoint control worked through that tyrosine um, um, phosphorylation. One more gene. Um, this was discovered by uh, my graduate student, Ian Hagen, um, <coughs> who cloned a gene we called CDC13. Why did he bother to clone it? Because it was a lot of work cloning these damn genes. Um, and the reason was that the phenotype had a mixed properties. It both arrested in mitosis with condensed chromosomes, yet had um, interphase microtubules. It didn't have mitotic spindles. So it looked as if it was partly in interphase, partly in mitosis. And I reasoned that maybe that meant it was on the edge. It was on the edge, and some things happened and some things didn't. And so we uh, sequenced it. David Beach, by the way, did the same experiment about the same time, was now working in Cold Spring Harbor, got the same results. And we showed that this lined up with um, a gene discovered by um, Tim Hunt, working with sea urchin, which he'd called cyclin. So this lined it up. And we went on to show CDC13 was necessary for CDC2 activity. So about this time, I drew this, OK? And this was uh, how I saw the onset of mitosis, CDC2 in the middle, complex with CDC13, regulates the onset of mitosis, controlled by uh, tyrosine phosphorylation, brought about by the WE1 protein kinase, taken off by CDC25, and a number of other genes that you see around there which interacted somehow that we didn't really um, under, um, understand. 
Now, once again, I was pleased with this. It was quite a nice story. Once again, it was uh, generally thought, well, this is all to do with yeast and is of no relevance. By this time, I was definitely working in the Imperial Cancer Research Fund, and I was surrounded by people who didn't care at all about yeast, except it might contaminate their tissue cultures. And, and, it, and, and in fact, um, Edith's old boss uh, wouldn't even let my lab go into the coffee room in case yeast jumped off their clothing um, onto um, their clothing and contaminated their, um, their cultures. Um, it was a very friendly institution. Do you remember, Edith? Yeah. So, um, so I thought, if I'm going to get these people to love me, I'm going to have to show this whole system works in, in human cells as well, should that be the case, which, of course, we had no idea. And luckily, um, Melanie Lee, this is this lady here on the left, came to my lab and said she'd like a difficult project. So I said, well, why don't you um, try and see if there is a CDC2 homolog in um, human beings? Um, there's only 1,500 million years evolutionary difference between them, so, I mean, shouldn't be too difficult. This was, of course, um, uh, 15 years before um, the sequencing of humans and, and so on, so we had no sequences to bear with. So being a real trooper um, and um, working very hard and very, very carefully, she had a go at it for um, a couple of years using methods that we don't even talk about now, like reduced stringency, sudden blotting, um, expression cloning in lambda and so on. I'm, some of you who have got white hair might remember this sort of stuff. Um, of course, we got protein kinases, and then I got depressed. I thought at the time Tony Hunter was speculating there's 2,000 protein kinases in human cells, so I thought, how the hell do we know we've even got the right thing here? So then I had the final idea. We could try and do it the same way as we'd done it with budding yeast. We could try and get a library of human genes and see whether we could rescue the CDC2 defect, because that would be not looking for structural similarity, but looking for functional equivalence. Now, that was thought to be barking mad, you know, 1,500 million years uh, too uh, demanding, um, really. And we didn't have a library, OK? And, of, of course, um, there's many introns, in, uh, uh, um, and introns are spliced out in fission yeast, but um, in, in different sorts of ways. And then Paul Berg made a library, a cDNA library, and he made it in an SV40 vector. And by chance, I knew that the SV40 promoter worked in fission yeast, because we'd done a little bit of mucking about with SV40 in fission yeast. I asked him for the library only a few weeks after he published it. He immediately sent it. And um, I, I didn't even ask Melanie to try and subclone it. I said, this won't work. Just, just put, it on the, put it on the cells, co-transform with another plasmid, because it will go in, and see if you get anything that grows. And something grew. Something grew. And um, this e experiment is described here. I, don't, I just did it. I forgot to put the slide on, but you've got the general sense. You know, there's a plasmid complementing the gene so that they, can, they don't die, they form it. And this is what the clone looked like. This is the very first clone. I photographed it, and you see it, the, it, the gene was on the plasmid. When it was lost, the cells couldn't um, uh, divide. They got elongated, and whilst it was there. So then I thought, well, my god, we are in, in, in the money here, really. If it's not an artifact, is it a suppressor? Did it, you know, fly in the window like Fleming's penicillin? Did it um, uh, pick something up from yeast? You know, every, there's everything you imagine. You go around, and we we went through all the controls. We got the gene back. We sequenced it. Now we could sequence it in about a month, but it still took a month or two to do it. And then it came out on the ticker tape, and. It was 60% identical at the amino acid level. This is shown here. Um, forgive the, um, the quality of it. Um, and it came from humans. So this meant that actually humans had the same gene. And not only that, you could take the human gene and put it into fission yeast. It worked there. And despite 1,000 to 1,500 million years divergence, and given that, it had to be the same everywhere in all eukaryotes. So just by the, that simple experiment. We use similar things to get mouse, chicken, fly, and, 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 and plants and stuff, um, and so um, could make that case. Now, 
we did a second thread to show that it was relevant, and that second thread of work was something called MPF, or maturation promoting factor. And again, some of you who are elderly might remember this. It's all to do with frogs, Xenopus frogs, and actually um, other marine, not marine, this is not a marine organism, but other organisms that are marine, like starfish and, um, and, and so on. And this, was, uh, 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 this is a paper I did uh, with Chris Norbury, who was a graduate student at ICRF at the same time, um, and in fact in the same lab as you were, and came and did a postdoc with um, me. This is work we did with Jim Maller. Um, Yoshio Masui was the guy who did most work on this at the time. Um, and what happened is you could inject cytoplasm from an emphase cell into a G2 arrested oocyte, and it would induce that G2 oocyte from Xenopus um, to uh, mature into an egg and to undergo emphase. So this was, if you like, a, a biological assay for a factor that promoted um, emphase. So I was obviously interested in this. Um, and had been for some years. I, I injected um, CDC2 cDNAs into uh, Xenopus to see if it mature. I got low-level um, MPF activity, couldn't, um, be, uh, couldn't believe it. But Jim Maller, great biochemist, purified MPF and um, uh, provided the purified MPF to us. We, by this time, had raised antibodies against the human CDC2 protein, and they cross-reacted. So that showed that MPF was also CDC2. I did the same experiment with Marcel Doré, who some of you may remember um, was at Montpellier, um, and um, another great biochemist, actually, really a quality biochemist. He turned up, didn't even say he was coming, he turned up um, at, at, at my lab in the evening, and I was there, and the very first thing he said is, you need to use H1 histone as your substrate. H1 histone as your substrate. And he was right. As soon as we put H1 histone in there, we got um, 10 times more activity. I'm dancing with him. I don't ask why exactly, but um, I, I am. He purified starfish. We showed it was um, the CDC2. So then I um, stuck the boat out and published this paper uh, that, that said all of this at the G2M transition um, is conserved from yeast to humans and everything else that we looked at involves CDC2, cycling, CDC25 and SUC1. And of course there was lots of other work going on, particularly Tim Hunt, degradation of cycling and so on, um, that was going on in parallel, certainly at the later stages um, of this, which I haven't referred to. I finished this part, which is the main part of my talk, in case you're getting nervous, um, I finished this part with a quote um, translated from um, the German of Theodor Schwann. We have seen that all organisms are composed of essentially like parts, namely of cells, that's the cell theory, that these cells are formed and grow in accordance with essentially the same laws. Hence that these processes must everywhere uh, 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 result from operation of the same forces. And it, that was said in 1839, it just took another 150 years to show that, that was the case. I've talked about onset of mitosis, and that what unlocked it, the key to unlocking it, um, and the logic it revealed, um, was to look for rate-limiting steps for the onset of mitosis. So I then thought we could apply the same logic to look for the onset of S phase, and to look for mutants in uh, genes to define the system that actually would undergo S phase when they shouldn't. And if you undergo S phase when you shouldn't, it's when you uh, get a G2 cell that once it's replicated its DNA shouldn't undergo S phase. But if you have mutants which do, then they endo-reduplicate and you go from haploid to diploid to tetraploid. So the question was, could we find any uh, mutations or any um, uh, situations when we could induce cells to endo-reduplicate? And the first hint of that came once again from CDC2. This was some work done by Dan Brock up there on the top left. And this was one of those weird papers. You, uh, when was it? 1991. He was playing around, interested in heat shocks. And he heat shocked a CDC2 mutant um, to 43 degrees for uh, half an hour or an hour or something. And then came to me and said, you know, um, there's lots of diploid cells, or lots of big cells, is what he said, being formed here. And I, I had a look at them when we tested, and they were diploid cells. And I said, which mutant, which alley, what gene were you doing? And he said, CDC2. And I thought, 
every time we do something, we get end up back with CDC two every single time. And um, I said, well, I don't know. I have no idea really what's going on, but we did expect, we confirmed it was the case. We looked at a number of alleles. And I came up with this model that you see here. I thought there were two forms of CDC2. You see it there? And that the heat shock of the M form, uh, heat treatment, turned it from an M form to an S form, and it underwent S phase. That, that was the model. Nobody took, for good reasons, the slightest bit of notice of this model because I had no biochemistry or anything. It was just a, another example of logic, you know, formal sort of way of thinking about the damn stuff. Um, then we were rescued um, in thinking about it um, by Jackie Hales, who was my first graduate student and had been, was working, um, has worked in my lab and actually retired only um, a week ago from my lab. And she was playing... Um, with uh, the uh, G2M cycling down there. This is my drawing here again. CDC 13. Remember it's in, uh, code by um, uh, uh, CDC um, 13. And um, she had the gene. She'd put it under a, a promoter so we could switch it off. So this wasn't a TS mutant. It was now just getting rid of the protein. So it was a more severe thing. And um, what did she see? She saw this, bottom left here. These cells were formed. Now, if you see, do you see the little cells with the little silvery blob? They are wild-type cells. These cells are massively endoreduplicated. So what she showed was that um, if, you get if you get rid of the CDC13 G2M cyclin, you cause constant endoreduplication. And you'll see down there, um, after some hours of this, you've got as many as 64. These, these uh, nuclei here um, are 64C, 64C. They just constantly endo um, reduplicate. And then we had a simpler model. We didn't have um, heat shocks turning from one state of protein to another. What we thought was, that if you look in the middle of this, this is CDK activity here, um, you'll see a triangle, which is a cyclin, uh, which is a CDC13 and CDC2 promoting mitosis. And we postulated that it also inhibited S phase. So what happened is that you got a G1S CDK activity to bring about S phase, then you produced a G2M CDK activity which inhibited S phase but promoted mitosis, and that's the reason why you only had one S phase per cell cycle. And John Diffley, in the end, went on to show that CDK did regulate functions in, a, in a, its biochemical um, uh, system. So once again, CDK came up, not only controlling the two major events of the cycle, but also um, playing a heavy role in assuring temporal order within the cell cycle. And I'll talk more about this um, next, um, in my lecture next, uh, next week. Then we did a screen looking for mutants and overexpressing mutants for cells which endo duplicated, and you see an example here. Um, we pulled out a gene called CDC18, and this uh, turned out to be the same as a gene in budding yeast called CDC6, where it's also known in um, mammalian cells, CDC6. And if you overexpress CDC18, you promote entry into S phase. So we postulated that CDC18 was a, um, a, an initiating factor of S phase. And um, furthermore, went on to show that another gene that we identified called CDT1, it had been identified um, uh, it, by David Beach about 10 years previously, um, but we implicated it in uh, this control. And if we overexpress both CDT18 and CDT1, which are now known to be initiation factors in S phase, we could once again get 32C to 64C. So it showed these were the major rate-limiting steps. And so um, for the onset of S phase, we, did, we looked at origins. People might be familiar with these sorts of plots here and showed that when we overexpressed um, the, uh, uh, if you uh, look um, at the bottom, CDC18 and CDT1, then we could promote um, from G2 arrested cells, that's these ones here, we could promote massive uh, reinitiation of uh, replication. Putting all of this together and going back to the logic, what did we then have? This is the, uh, the position we were really with the cell cycle <coughs> um, at, at the end of this sort of studies. The beginning required 
Um, CDC 2, that's not on here, and CDC 10 acting at start. CDC-10 was a transcription factor that promoted CDC-18 and CDT-1. These factors promote initiation of S phase, and that's been shown to be the case, as I said, in vitro experiments in budding yeast subsequent to this. And that um, brings about onset of S phase. If we overexpress these factors in, um, in G2, you will block onset of mitosis. So there's a negative signal um, that stops um, onset of mitosis. And so the way we logically describe that is that in G1, you have components that bring about um, what is legitimate for a G1 cell to do, which is to go into S phase, and blocks those events that are illegitimate, which is to go into mitosis. And we see that there with uh, the CDT1 and CDC18. If we now go into G2, as I've already explained to you, the mitotic kinase, CDC2 with CDC13, promotes the legitimate event of mitosis, but inhibits the illegitimate event, which is to go into S phase, unless you kill the CDK activity, in which case, actually, you go into um, repeated rounds of DNA replication. So this was where the logic got us to, okay? And um, what I didn't contribute very much to... Um, Oh, that's just another slide saying the same sort of thing, which um, I should have moved to a bit quicker and didn't. Okay, so I won't go through that. But what I didn't do was indicate that by this time, the Metazone um, uh, uh, colleagues had identified a, a, a quite a range of different CDKs and cyclins and come up with the model that you see here, which we uh, um, partially adopted for fission yeast, that there were different CDKs, CDK2, um, and CDC2, now known as CDK1, cyclin E and A required at the G1S um, transition and B for the G2M. And it, these, these qualitatively different CDK activities that are underlying temporal order in the cycle. I put this slide up here because I'm about to stop. And um, in my talk next week, I will say I don't think this is true as the organizing principle of the cell cycle, and I will give you evidence of why I think it's even simpler than this, again, applying the logic to it. But that's for um, next week. There is some truth in it, and I'll explain why, what I mean about that, um, but that this, is, this is where we were basically at about the year 2000 in looking at this. And there I'm going to stop having, I hope, uh, shown you that... that Almost all of this was underpinned by really just observation, um, standard classical genetics, then complemented by molecular genetics, and thinking about the logic of the system. And I, I, I worry a bit that we now have so many technologies available to us that we tend to apply endless technologies and we have no time to think about what it all means and no time to think about the logic. When you're just looking for mutants, month after month after month. You think about stuff. When you're doing the thousands of amazing things that we can do today, you don't have time to think about what it means biologically. You have to think why it didn't work on the machine that you put it through and all this sort of stuff. And I have tried to encourage a shift that we should go back to thinking about it. And I wanted to talk about this logic because that's what's driven it here. And next week, we'll take the same sort of approach but bring you up to date and give you a different view. Thank you very much. Thank you.